Today we are celebrating the feast of Saint Anne, the mother of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the grandmother of our Lord. She and her husband, Saint Joachim, were good and God-fearing, but to their sorrow, God had not sent them any children. For years and years, Saint Anne prayed the Lord to give her a child, and she promised that if her wish would be granted, this child would be consecrated to God's service. Finally, she gave birth to Mary, the one who would become the mother of God. During Mary's first years, Saint Anne took good care of her and then gave her to the service of God in the temple, as she had promised. Of course, Saint Anne was immensely happy to become a mother, but it was even greater happiness to her that by becoming a mother, she would participate in God's glory and salvation, and she would do this by forming and educating her daughter to be a good and humble servant of God. Saint Anne's life is a lesson to all the parents. The principal duty of the parents is the holy education of their children. Doing this, the parents glorify their Creator, keep God's honor on earth to future ages, and sanctify their own souls. Those who wish to become parents have to therefore, when seeking and choosing a potential spouse, choose one who is likewise ready to submit the future home into God's service. Another Joachim, that of the book of Daniel, took as his wife Susanna because she was a girl who feared God and her parents had instructed her according to God's law. St. Paul teaches that women are not allowed to teach men because a woman's part in a Catholic family is the generation and rearing and sanctification of children, and she can attain salvation only if she raises her children in faith, love, and sanctification. Today I want to emphasize you the heroism of our religious vocation, of which parents should often mention and talk to their children. During the recent girls' camp, I talked to our girls about Old Testament heroines, Judith, Jael, and Rahab. And today I'll talk to you about a heroine whose name is not recorded in the Holy Scripture. She is the daughter of Jephthah, whom his father offered as a sacrifice to God, and who humbly accepted this tribulation. If you are not familiar with the story, you can read that from the book of Judges, chapter 11, but in short, it goes like this. Jephthah lived in a time when the Israelites started again to worship idols. So God sent her a foreign tribe called the Ammonites to conquer Israel, and they held it under oppression for 18 years. The Israelites, since they were desperate in the battle against the Ammonites, went to see Jephthah, who was heading a wild band of outlaws to recruit him and his troops to fight on their side. They promised that Jephthah would be their new leader if he would succeed in conquering the Ammonites. So Jephthah made a vow, saying, If thou wilt deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, O God, whosoever shall first come forth, out of the doors of my house, and shall meet me returning with peace from the children of Ammon, him will I offer an holocaust to our Lord. Jephthah had great success, and the Ammonites were beaten. But when he returned to his home, the first person he came uh, to, to came to greet him was his daughter, his only child. Jephthah rent his garments and said, Woe is me, my daughter, thou hast deceived me, and thyself art deceived, for I have opened my mouth to our Lord, 
and can do no other thing. And hearing about the vow of her father, she, the daughter, willingly offered herself as the burnt offering. She only asked that she could go to the mountains for two months to mourn that she had to die without marriage. After two months had passed, she returned, and Jephthah sacrificed her. This sacrifice started a yearly custom where the Israeli women would assemble together and mourn Jephthah's daughter for four days. Dear faithful, the story of Jephthah's daughter has troubled Christians and Jews alike for thousands of years. Many commentaries have attempted to explain away the striking image of Jephthah's killing his only precious child and offering her up as a burnt offering. It is also pointed out by the enemies of Christianity in repeatedly how obedience to this seemingly cruel God overlooks the murder of the daughter. Some others, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, have tried to explain that Jephthah did not really kill his daughter, but meant to devote her exclusively to the service of God. In their view, Jephthah was sad because fulfilling the vow meant losing the company of his beloved only child. But when we look into this fascinating story of this free offering given to Almighty God, it is clear that Jephthah really did sacrifice his daughter. He said, Whosoever shall first come forth out of the doors of my house, him will I offer an holocaust to our Lord. And after the period of mourning, Jephthah's daughter returned to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed. But the whole lesson of this passage is not in the rashness of Jephthah's vow. After all, human sacrifice was forbidden by God, but in the heroic submission of his daughter. For the sake of obedience and humility to the vow made in honor of God in thanksgiving for the liberation of his people, she put down her own life as a sacrifice. The story of Jephthah's daughter, as well as St. Anne's dedication of her daughter Mary to serve God in the temple, gives us the whole beauty of what religious vocation is. In a religious vocation, somebody willingly gives up the benefices of life to consecrate himself to God's service. Of course, the sorrows which a just servant of God has to go through are not restricted to religious only. The sorrows are part of the life of every Christian. But those sorrows are truly all light and easy to bear in comparison to the virtue of humility of the suffering Christ. And this is something the world can never understand. You, dear faithful, you see the great sacrifice of not a mere man, but God himself, every single time you go to the Holy Mass. In the Mass, the priest puts himself in Christ's place to assume the garments and take up instruments of the Passion. Calvary is before the priest. He will go up its steps. When the priest kisses the altar, he is kissing the cross, and each bending down to it marks one of Christ's falls from its glorious way. The washing of the hands takes the priest back to a scene in Pilate's Hall of Judgment. The flowing wine is the flowing blood from Christ's wounded head, side, and feet. During the canon, the priest nails his own body to the cross of sacrifice. At the breaking of the host, he resolves to break his will to do the will of God. When he covers the chalice, he buries himself with Christ from the world and all its temptations. And at the blessing, he arises with Christ to the completion of his triumph in the resurrection. 
When one dedicates his or her life for religion, whether it's serving God as a priest, lay brother, or religious sister, he, by necessity, is put in the war front against the world. And in this sense, religious vocation is always a sad for separation from the earthly family. Saint Anne was mourning when she had to depart from her beloved Mary, saying, My beloved daughter, for many years I have longed for thee, and only for a few years do I merit to have thy company. But thus let the will of God be fulfilled. I do not wish to be unfaithful to my promise of sending thee to the tent. And also Jephthah's daughter was in the state of mourn, for she would never grow up and have children, but faithful to God, she said to him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth to our Lord, do unto me whatsoever thou hast promised, the revenge and victory of thine enemies being guaranteed to thee. The humili humility of a faithful servant of God is truly something the people of the world cannot understand. The enemies of the church desire the distinguishing of the religious vocations, especially if they can do that with the banishing of chastity. The enemies of the church are constantly on watch and seeking evidence that religious vocations are the thing of the past and gloat over even an appearance of a loss of that virtue. But putting temporal benefits before the service of God can never be part of those who dedicate themselves to the service of their crucified Christ. Our Lord himself said, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourning means the sadness of the soul. The reason we mourn is our sadness because of sin. In mourning we mourn both the causes of sin, that is temptations, frailties and dangers, as well as its consequences, that is, the trials and evils of this life. The soul mourns because it wants to go to God in heaven. Therefore, a Catholic uh, religious follows the beatitude of mourning by doing penance and following strictly the commandments of God's law and offering himself as a sacrifice in reparation for his and the sins of the world. Jephthah's daughter was one of those God's humble souls who was mourning. She asked for a delay of two months in order that she might go with her companions to the mountains to bewail her virginity now given up to death. The weeping of her companions did not move her, their grief did not prevail upon her, nor did their lamentations hold her back. But she returned to her father and of her own will she urged him on when he was hesitating to sacrifice her. She acted of her own free choice, so that what was first at first an awful thing became a pious sacrifice. Clearly God loves and rewards those sacrifices which a humble soul is ready to go through in the middle of all the injustices of the world and during his struggles for the truth. So greatly does the just man will to serve God that he is ready to be even killed by the enemies of God. Because in this way, God's servant, like God himself, has returned good for evil. That is, he has returned love instead of hatred. In imitation of Abel, Thousands of martyrs have struggled for the truth to the point of death and have been sacrificed by savage enemies. Numerous and numerous holy men and women have offered themselves as victims for God, both by sacrificing their own life, like the daughter of Jephthah, or serving him in spirit of humility, consecrating themselves totally to God's service like the Blessed Virgin Mary, the daughter of St. Anne. 
Parents should never love their children more than they love God, so that they would stop their, them answering the call of God in a religious vocation. Lots of parents in the history of the church have gone through sorrow to lose their child to religious vocation. Saint Philomena, herself born as a single daughter to a long-time childless royal couple, made a vow of chastity at eleven and rejected the marriage to an emperor. Their parents pleaded, O oh daughter, have pity on your parents, have pity on your country. But she said that her vow to God would take precedence to everything else and was beheaded by the cruel emperor. The venerable Ursula Benincasa, a 17th century Italian religious, established the order named Sisters of the Hermitage. These were bound to perpetual abstinence and several fast days. The life of these sisters was one of the most absolute separation from the world. On the day of their profession, the sisters were allowed to speak with their nearest relatives for the last time. After that, they would never see them again. Just like with the religious, Jephthah's vow to sacrifice his daughter caused her to withdraw from the world for a while, the world filled with idolatry, violence, and wars. Had she lived in the land of Israel, blinded by its false religion and surrounded by its temptations, there is no knowing what should she have become. Remember her house, which was that of a bandit and of a robber. Moreover, she received the grace to be told when her end would come, and she retired from the world to remember the great truths and faith and God. In this sense, every Catholic is always and every day exhorted to remember that one day, in one way or another, he will be held accountable for all his past actions. Holy Scripture puts it, In all thy works remember thy later ends, and thou wilt not sin forever. We are exhorted on Ash Wednesday to remember our last end when the priest places ashes on our head with the words, Remember, man, that thou art dust, and into dust thou shalt return. When Saint Anne died, even Our Lady, who was twelve years old then, felt sorrow of her loss and lonely, having been left orphaned down on earth. But in the midst of them, she gave praise to God of all the graces he had shown to her mother, both in life and in death. Because she was the mother of Mary, and grandmother of our Lord, all the nations may call her blessed. The one who is dead to the world will never miss any of the riches and pumps of the world, but welcomes and is in expectation, in expectation of death, when death, like in the cases of Saint Anne and Jephthah's daughter, will remit them to see their good creator. An American mariner named Thomas Smith, who had fought in many naval battles, wrote a beautiful poem which well emphasizes a Christian's acceptance of death as a liberator. Why, why should I, the world, be minding, therein a world of evils finding? Then farewell, world, farewell thy jars, thy joys, thy toys, thy vials, thy wars. Truth sounds retreat, I am not sorry, the Eternal draws to him my heart, by faith which can thy force subvert, to crown me after grace with glory. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.